Hi, welcome everybody uh, to TWR Facebook Live. So I hope uh, all of you hear me clear, see me clear. Uh, it's always a little challenging to do this uh, Facebook Live from India. So I am in India right now. Uh, it's a uh, I think it's about 8.30 in the evening. So happy to be, uh, be here with all of you. Hope everybody's doing well. My greetings from India. Um, to, so today's uh, topic, uh, the pith instruction uh, from my personal reflections in the Dzogchen tradition, Dzogchen teachings. Um, so today's topic is the overcoming obstacles in the spiritual path. So uh, I think uh, I wanted to maybe uh, discuss this, the spiritual obstacles and how to overcome this in a two different um, piece. Um, the one I want to talk a little bit in a sense of uh, from traditional view uh, from from the t doctrine uh, what we talk about the the obstacles of view uh, obstacles of meditation and the obstacles of fruition so the result so uh, so generally you know we we know view, meditation, and conduct. This is the way in which many different tenet systems are described, different doctrines are described. Uh, so I think in, a, in, in some sense in a Dzogchen, in a, trying to keep it very simple way, uh, also Dzogchen has a view, it has its own meditation, it has its own uh, uh, fruition or result, and generally we say boundless view, uh, self-arising meditation, and um, flexible behavior, conduct. So if, if the view is boundless, then there is no boundaries to obscure the meditation. So that means naturally meditation should be more spontaneously arising so if the meditation is spontaneously arising, so whatever the conduct comes out of that experience should be more flexible because there is no boundary to condition any uh, behaviors. So that's the idea of general, very simple way of idea of uh, Dzogchen view, meditation and conduct. So, so somebody who uh, follow this path, you know, somebody who uh, s genuinely um, interested in learning, hearing, reflecting, contemplating, pursuing this path. That means what kind of obstacles that we will face as a practitioner of Dzogchen. So basically what kind of obstacles that we will face as a practitioner of Dzogchen. That's the more, I think, the first part of the discussion here. So, so for example, the view. Um, Unlike like in the Sutra or in Tantric, Dzogchen view is different and uh, also the approach of understanding, learning is also quite different. Um, I say that different is because uh, in Bern tradition, Ati, Dzogchen, Shanxin Yinju, these different lineages of Dzogchen teachings, they have been scholars, they have been yogis, there have been lay people, monks, there have been scholars and so also illiterate people who uh, did not uh, uh, not read or write. There are yogis like that also. So some sense what I'm trying to say here is that being uh, to be a Dzogchen practitioner is not required to learn a specific language not required to learn a specific doctrine system, not required to learn a specific amount of uh, years to intellectually study or learn, 
but it does require a deep karmic ripening, uh, genuine encounter of genuine master, and then so the karmic connection. These things are required. So, so anyway, trying to not get, not get into long story, is that um, um, what is the obstacles of the view? View in Dzogchen, I think one thing very obstacle of the view is people who so much intellectual, people who likes to question about everything, doubt about everything, discuss about everything, argue about everything, debate about everything, and probably in the end of all of this and disagree and get totally get confused. So these are type of personality, uh, type of mindset, uh, it's not a good. So if, uh, if, even though you might not be that kind of personality, type of person, but you maybe have still have tendency to do those kind of things. I just give one example. When I was learning at Dzogchen, Shangshu Nyeji, with my teacher, Lopez Sanji Tenzin Rinpoche, and um, for three years we studied at Shangshu Nyeji. During that time, uh, really he would not encourage us to ask questions. So, uh, and uh, sometime he, he was, uh, um, how you say, uh, not a peaceful master, so he was a wrathful master. So sometime even you ask questions, he would, he would, you know, he, the response would not be very, very good. So you also have to be very careful. So, so basically, um, what I'm trying to say here is, it's not so much encouraged to ask questions, think a lot, question a lot, doubt a lot, not. It, it, you are really more um, expected or you're hopefully not expected, but hopefully you are more ripened to just hear, listen and be uh, that personality. So uh, once we finished the Dzogchen cycle of teaching, then we were studying us some epistemology with him and then he after three years he started to teach some epistemology and then we were we were asked to discuss and debate with him and nobody was you know wanting to discuss or debate with him because we are so used to uh, three years of listening and reflecting and not asking and doubting and questioning and uh, we it was kind of challenging shift was difficult so so the basically obstacle of Dzogchen teaching particularly in the view it's not think a lot, doubt a lot, question a lot, discuss a lot. And sometimes, I, as a teacher, I know in the West, sometimes people would um, ask a lot of questions. I, I, as a teacher, allow a lot of questions. But when people ask the question, I can feel sometimes questions are genuinely even though I always try to ask people to say, please uh, ask questions directly to related to the teaching that I'm teaching. Ask questions uh, more related with your experience, personal reflections, not theoretical, conceptual, like that. But even though still people would sometimes get into telling what, how much they know, how much they understand, it's like a little bit like a um, sh showing off, I guess. So, of course, when you do that, that is an obstacle. And of course, somebody got to recognize. Uh, if I recognize, that's not helpful. And um, but, what student or someone who's doing that should be should recognize that is an obstacle when somebody. Um, show off and say, or show off and ask questions, show off and reflect, show off and think intellectually. So these are called view obstacles of view. It's the process of learning in which you make it everything so much theoretical and conceptual. Uh, so so that, that is an obstacle of view. The second is the obstacle of meditation. So meditation is that point is not about so much about talking, listening or or thinking or reflecting. It's more about 
ap application of the view, the more about whatever you understood, trying to apply that into meditation. And in the, what is Dzogchen meditation? It's, it's not a conceptual process. It's not even a process. It's not even trying to do anything. It's really uh, a state of being presence and being fully aware of that uh, presence. So I think uh, in some sense um, um, there's no conceptual part. So what, what requires is, um, for example, those who think a lot, and uh, those who analyze a lot, those who doubt a lot, questions a lot, when they stop doing that, they're kind of paralyzed. They become like a dumb and numb, and they 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 begin to follow fall asleep, or they get very agitated. Once once you once they stop thinking, they get agitated, or they start to fall asleep. This is exactly what happens to people who who meditate. Dzogchen meditation after, you know, having those kind of obstacles. So in Dzogchen meditation we say Chingwa Mukpa Tipa. So basically it's like a <clears throat> not enough alertness, not enough sharpness, not enough awakening, not enough presence, not enough aware, being aware, uh, self-aware. Um, or wherever your eyes are resting in, in the sky, in the objects, in the images, uh, on experiences like us, openness and joy or compassion or something like that. Um, being alert and aware and present enough is what we, what we call good meditation. Self-arising, uh, self-arising, uh, effortless presence would be more uh, uh, genuine meditation, but when somebody is don't have that, and when somebody is immediately become numb, a little bit like a dumb, a little like a begin to fall asleep, then that is called obstacle of meditation. So this is a this is an obstacle for spiritual path. So and particularly, it it is truly like obstacle of spiritual path because. Uh, that awareness is the path, that awareness is the spiritual practice, and those, those um, sleepiness, dullness, uh, conceptual ag agitations are obstacles. So, um, but you know, I think uh, many people have a habit of doing that, so uh, that's kind of really like a dangerous thing that we say, you know, uh, even um, in Tibetan is saying that you know when animal uh, cat, for example, cat sitting in the near on the window near the window and sitting like in a meditation position looks like a cat is doing a meditation, but cat is not able to. I'm not judging all the cats. There might be some enlightened cat, some bodhisattva cat, but generally speaking, they if they're not self-aware in, in that state. So if you are like a, just being like that, hot, not clay enough, not presence enough, and uh, but still being in a meditation position, close eye, that is a little bit like a, the cat sitting on the window, lack of awareness, and uh, mind is obscured. So that is exactly obstacle of meditation. Um yeah, so maybe maybe I'll emphasize one thing more is because sometime as I'm speaking right now, maybe some of you think, well, that's my normal state of meditation. I, I meditate most of the time when I meditate, I fall asleep. You know, when I'm guiding a meditation after lunch, I see a lot of people following sleep. Okay, I can understand it's after lunch, it's all, maybe, not enough fresh air, room is warm, somebody is tired, I get it. But if there is a pattern that you frequently follow sleep, moment you begin to meditate, that pattern is not a good, because you 
not only you are doing it, but you are, are you are so comfortable in the obstacle of meditation. You kind of almost identify yourself in the obstacle of meditation. You are so used to it, so used to it, you identify it. It's, you, for you, it's difficult to even recognize or able to recognize the need to change something. Not, you don't even put effort to change it. You don't even recognize to change it. You are so comfortable with that obstacle of meditation. That is really like, I think I, I would more, um, kind of emphasize more and say that if any, any of you are in that kind of situation, and uh, highly recommend to be self-reflective this very moment as I am describing it. So, so I talked about obstacles of the view, obstacles of meditation, now obstacles of behavior or conduct. Very generally speaking, particularly in a Dzogchen, uh, one of the obstacles of conduct will be people would, there are people who say, I am Dzogchen practitioner, therefore I can do anything. I am beyond. Um, everything. I am beyond conceptual mind. I, I am. I practice non-duality. Um, I, I practice one taste. I practice single sphere of light, and so I can kind of do anything. So people get into. There are historically there are people who have the um, very lack of awareness in their conduct and their behavior because they claim to have some realization because of the, what type of practice they do, like they're practicing great perfection in the Dzogchen. So that is a, really like an obstacle, and uh, it has been in historically there have been people like that, and uh, you continuously see people like that, and if you see people like that, you try to recognize but not be one, and uh, we say, Tawan nam khatan yam na chopan midanti. This is a saying in Tibetan, even your meditation is like a sky, boundless like a sky, but behave like a human. So uh, behave like a human means being sensitive, being aware of other people, being aware of other people's thoughts, feelings, being sensitive. So this is what, uh, what has been said. So, so the conduct is very important that everybody is um, more conscious about their behavior. So, um, yeah, so more uh, sensitive, basically sensitive about their behavior. So these are the three uh, obstacles of, um, I'm trying to keep it very simple so that everybody can understand, obstacles of uh, the view, obstacles of meditation, and obstacles of conduct. So, um, so I hope this is a little bit clear, at least area, basically what he's saying in summary, in, in short, don't conceptualize if you are interested in Dzogchen practice. Don't put too much effort if you are practice, interested in Dzogchen practice. Learn to be, not trying to be. Learn to rest, not put effort. These are typical obstacles of Dzogchen. So these are particularly related to the view. When you meditate, don't fall asleep. When you meditate, don't think too much. Uh, if you do think, recognize you are conceptualizing things, you are, you're, you are getting lost into the, your mind rather than uh, effortlessly state of being. So these are basically simple explanation of what this is saying as obstacles. And the other thing is maybe, the other part I wanted to say, maybe say a few words, is, okay, let's maybe, maybe uh, let's meditate a little bit. Uh, we can all, just for, for a short meditation, uh, since uh, last few times we have not uh, meditated together, so I think uh, it would be nice to we sit a little bit together, okay? Okay, now for a moment you can stop clicking. Find a comfortable position.
trying to keep your spine straight, chest slightly open, chin slightly down. Bring your full attention inward. Take five deep breathing, but breathe comfortably deep. And each exhalation, just breathe it out any discomfort that you are experiencing this moment, physically, energetically, emotionally. Now bring your full attention to your body from the sole of the feet to the crown. Be fully aware, feel, connect so that your mind is fully connected and presence in your body. They are nourishing each other. As you are still, be aware of that stillness. As you silence, be aware of the silence, feel the silence. Rest in that silence.
Be aware of your openness of your heart, your mind, like a crystal clear sky in the desert. You are that crystal clear sky in the desert and you are aware of that and you feel that and fully rest in that sacred space. So rest in that sacred space like a child resting in the loving arms of mother. with no effort, with the trust, with sense of connectedness, a feeling home, feeling protected, feeling cared, loved, and feeling nourishment from that source, through this experience of love and care, the inner sacred space, the boundless sacred space, is the mother, you are the child. As long as you are connected to that sacred space, you are charging, you are nourishing, you are healing, you are protected. Like a, like a phone, when it's connected to the source, power source, it's charging. Like you, when it's connected to that source, that unbounded sacred space, you are charging, you are nourishing, you are healing. Feel that, trust that. And also feel that the cyber sangha, the cyber community, that we all not necessarily know each other and not necessarily we have to know each other, we are connected to each other in this moment. All these people who are practicing this moment together, which is beyond time and space, We are all connected. We are all supporting each other. I am send, sending my support to all of you. And I am open to receive support from all of you. Resting in that boundless space without conceptual mind, being present in that sacred space without putting effort, particularly the ego, not conceptualizing, grasping any experiences, just being 
then you do overcome obstacles of view, meditation, and conduct. Just continuously rest for a moment. Okay. Now you can open your eye. So how was the meditation? So in meditation, so basically the meditation of Dzogchen, um, there is aspect of boundless space, which is the view, that there is a spontaneous um, self-awareness um, or self-arising awareness, spontaneous awareness, which is the meditation, and experiences arising there, we, well, like we call nyam, this is out of their experiences, whatever manifestation arises through your body, speech, and mind as a conduct. So, but they, those those are usually flexible. So this, so this is, uh, I think, um, some sense of connected to what we are discussing here. Now, the second other part of the um, obstacle, I will maybe just say a little bit. It's uh, more like a practical aspect and the life. For example, particularly in the West, uh, a spiritual materialism, so that when people have certain view in their life, their certain upbringing, uh, specific education, and particularly when you grow up in a very materialistic view, or very in, in, uh, individualistic um, sense, then when you enter into the spiritual path, when entering into the particularly spiritual path of the Dzogchen, and you, even though in some sense, a deep sense, you wanted to clear that, you wanted to free from those patterns, but somehow you bring all those packages together, and when you enter into the spiritual path, and you keep doing the same, exactly the same thing. So, I don't know, me, my meditation, I wanted to follow uh, the famous teacher, I wanted to uh, practice the highest practice, I wanted to practice the, the shortest practice uh, which achieved to enlightenment, and I wanted to practice the best one, short, shortest one, you know, like some sense of always this sense of I, the best, the shortest, uh, personal, and uh, I don't know, mm, uh, some sense of um, even you practice, you get into very much, very much like a materialistic view, as if you're get, getting, getting, I don't know, going to the restaurant and getting a point, or each time you get a, I say, a punch of a click, and when you get a certain, certain uh, punches, then you get a free drink or something like that, in the spiritual path. You trying to behave the same way, a uh, very materialistic way, very individualistic way, uh, and uh, ego is somehow um, it's it's much more harder when when the ego is manifesting in the spiritual path than when ego is just manifesting on more like an ignorant path. Well, then it's easy to you can call it ignorance. You can easily trying to recognize and isolate and trying to work on it, but when it becomes a part of, part of the, your spiritual path, uh, like sometimes what I call it, 
smart ego, smart ego. And uh, smart ego is hard to overcome because it can, it might call itself meditation, it might call itself path, it might it's call itself something that you don't want it to get rid of, but something that you want it to enhance more. So, so that is very important, not to be spiritual materialistic and not to in, be very individualistic, you know, like my practice, uh, don't disturb me, uh, go away, this is my, th my cushion, this is my area, this is, I reserve this place, uh, nobody can sit here. I don't know, very much like a territorial, materialistic, individualistic, same pattern bringing into, this, in, into meditation, spiritual community and so on. So I think that is something that uh, we should all be very aware of that. That's one thing I wanted to say. Basically, yeah, so that's one thing. And the second thing is what, what I call Nyamda Ripa Norva. So like a, a not to get confused between the experiences and uh, so uh, how you say wisdom and knowledge. You not to get confused between the wisdom and knowledge or the awareness and uh, the experiences. So when you are fully present in an inseparable state of clarity and emptiness, in you, when you are fully present in that awareness and that sacred space, that is like a meditation. But some experiences arises there, like when you feel like um, people would... For example, many times people would love to talk about their experiences. They like to, they, they like to say, I, I felt this, I saw this, there was a blue light there, there is a green light there, there is the kini appears, and uh, this angel talked to me, and I don't know, so much ex individual experiences that people, I'm, I'm not saying they are not valuable, I'm not saying they are not good, uh, I, and what I'm saying is basically, um, they are just an experience, you know, so um, not to get too excited, agitated, um, yeah, so not to get too caught up with the experiences. Um, they are just experiences and they, you, you have one time, Next time you might not have you might not have that. Next time you might have something different, but not get too much caught up with the experiences. Uh, then why? Because sometimes people g get too much ex uh, excited or caught up with the experiences. Then it interferes the state of being. That it interferes the resting. That it interferes the abiding. What, what meditation is, in a, some sense of being, resting, abiding, uh, being aware, is what is the meditation is. Uh, not uh, getting lost with some deep experiences, some in deep, ex intense experiences. I mean, they are beautiful, but uh, they are not the primary. So I think, so that's one thing I would say, when people get too much caught up with the, uh, with their experiences, that this is an obstacle also, and you you wanted to tell everybody what their your experiences is, and then people you feel like people are not listening to your experiences, you get hurt, and oh you feel like oh my teacher is not listening to my experiences. This is very deep experiences, very important personal, ex very important my experiences, very important my personal experiences, and I have trying to share that and my teacher did not listen or my friend did not listen and my, I don't know, husband or wife, partner did not listen and you get, you know, yeah, you get caught up with those conditions. So, so basically separating the wisdom and experiences, awareness and experiences. And the other thing is also, I think, some sense of, uh, as we genuinely, when we are interested in a spiritual path, one thing what we do, we're trying to seek 
a teacher, we're trying to seek a path, we're trying to seek a community, and we want to seek, basically we want, we, 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 want, we are seeking for a support, which is very, very, I think, which is a proper thing to do, which is the right thing to do. Uh, you do need a path, you do need a teacher, you do need a Sangha who can support, you do need the right kind of environment, I think all of them are right thing to look for if you need 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 these these things. But once you find something, you find a teacher, you find a path, you find a sangha, you find a place, a meditation center, a temple, monastery, and then you're trying to enter into this relationship with the teacher. You're trying to enter enter into this relationship with the community, you're trying to enter into this relationship with, with the organization uh, in the monastery or something like that, and with a very high expectation, again, again, in some sense, I think, obstacle, it really becomes obstacle when you are not trying to tame yourself, um, when you're trying to look for a wrong sense of self, when you're trying to look for um, wrong, yeah, basically wrong sense of self, and uh, and you get into these these situations. Then what happens is usually people. I have seen so many times many situations where people, you know, get people. I mean, even to me, people come. This is my personal experience. They will say, "Oh, you know, you you are the best teacher. You." I, I found you, I can, you are my root teacher, you are this and that, and you know, I hear those things, and I usually try to keep it cool, it's fine, and not trying to um, get, say anything particular when people say those things, but, but then uh, after some time, then they start to have some problems, um, so their, their expectations not fulfilled, they get something hurt, and then, and then suddenly they begin to lose um, some sense of connection to, to the organization, to the community, to the Sangha, to me, to the teaching, and then they start to send the Thangkas back to me, or, or to say, okay, you can do the, this Thangka, and some, I have some pictures that I bought in auctions, and I bought it in a shop here, and now you can take them back, you know, uh, do the, how you say, um, do it auction, or, that's even a nice thing to offer back, but, but, the, but the idea of uh, sending it back is somehow uh, disconnected, basically. And so I think that is, I sometimes, I personally feel very sad and very sorry that uh, able to, I think it's good to keep the relationship very clear. Um, the teacher is a teacher, not a partner, husband, boyfriend, uh, anything like that. Teacher is just a teacher that you, relationship is a different, that you're trying to keep more. Um, I have over 40 years of my relationship with my teacher. There were a time I live in the same house and ate in the same place and grow up together. Uh, I'm grow up under, I mean, and then, and then, so now I'm, I get to see once a year, twice a year, and um, so just some sense of um, it's my responsibility to work with my relationship, my doubts, my frustrations, my expectations. It's purely my responsibility to do that. And um, if if teacher did not fulfill my some of my needs and expectations, and then I'm, I I have to recognize and work with that, not to immediately. Uh, blame my teacher and uh, so on, or, or my sangha or, or the group or something like that. If I have one problem with one person, one member of the community, I don't have to have problem with all the member of the community. I don't have to have um, problem with the the, the teaching, or, or I don't have to have problem with the teacher or something like that. So, or maybe if I do have a problem, if somebody does have a problem with the teacher, then they don't have to have a problem with the tradition. Or their practice and so on. So somehow able to keep things a little bit more separate, clear, not mix things together. And I think these are in a very practical life. There are there are a lot of obstacles like that in a spiritual path because uh, 
end of the day, the word spiritual part, in some sense of what really like a following teacher, following tradition, following Sangha, uh, and um, deep sense, at least in the Burn tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, the whole idea is to really like working with self-grasping the ego. So some sense of uh, um, always, always some sense of able to self-reflect. Am I doing it for me? Am I doing it even for me personally, you know, I, I sometimes ask these questions about Facebook, you know. I say, it does take a lot of energy, time. I'm sitting in here in Majnugatila. This is the place where some of you might know in, the, in, the, in India and trying to find the right place to have internet, putting a lot of effort. But then I ask question to myself, am I, is it really helpful, you know? Am I, am I being helpful here? Am I... Um, is it useful? Is it a meaningful? Or, or maybe maybe the most important question is: Am I doing for myself? Is it? For, am I doing for the ego? And uh, and uh, if if I, that's a question that I ask myself, if I feel that sense of oh I'm doing for myself, then I have to work with that. Then I have to stop doing it, or then I have to overcome and then do it. Uh, somehow I need to, to reflect that. So. I, Entering into the spiritual path is, um, you know, like, um, are you entering into the community trying to find your uh, power, uh, position, uh, or you're entering into the community just because you have give up your power, you have give up your ego, you have let go of that in the first place, that's why you're entering into the community. So whatever you're doing there is just purely you're doing as a service, not to feed your ego or not to find, uh, do a power struggling and, and you know, like oh, getting all, all, getting all these kind of conflict power struggles and so on. And there are many people who sometimes entering into do, that do those things. So, so some sense of, is always questioning oneself, am I doing for my ego? Am I doing it my, for my pain? Am I doing it for power or something like that? Or am I doing it uh, for service? Uh, am I, I see the value about doing it, how many people are benefiting, at least if some, it makes somebody's day good, if support somebody is going through a difficult moment, if I'm being able to help that, and if maybe that's all what it really matters at the end of the day, and if these words are helpful, then it's worth doing it, basically. So, uh, yeah, so basically, motivation, I guess, is a motivation that uh, checking one's own motivation, checking again and again. And um, I think in that way, one will last longer into the spiritual path, one will last longer in relationship with the master and the student, one will last longer in, in the services position, whatever you are trying to do, you know you can do it. You also know you can give it up any time. You, you can let go of that position any time if it's necessary. If somebody else is doing a better job than you are doing it, I'll let it go. And, uh, and so on. So I think there's some sense of uh, um, not get confused in that. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, I think more or less um, um, I think I'm. I think it's finished today, <laughs> and I guess uh, um, time is over also. So, so I hope that uh, all of you are. This was a little bit helpful, and uh, it's nice to see all the familiar faces. And um, as you all know, still uh, so many. Uh, beautiful uh, condolence letters that the uh, Mary Monastery is receiving from from all the high lamas and all the different uh, Tibetan government uh, governmental institutions and all the um, different many many different monasteries uh, from all different schools beautiful heartwarming letter is somehow uh, even in the communities like in uh, um, California, the Tibetan community in Northern California gathering together for prayer. I know New York, New Jersey, in Charlottesville, in 
in many people in many places in Europe people are getting together and praying for His Holiness and I appreciate that very much and I appreciate very much all of you who have been reciting uh, the prayers, long line mantras and reciting His invocation, four line invocations. So this is what I think um, all community coming together, feeling close to each other, supporting each other and uh, this is it's a beautiful uh, thing to see and I also see people are sharing so many beautiful rainbows from from Tibet to Europe to you know from all over on the Facebook Facebook so uh, uh, these are beautiful rainbows this is uh, where are coming out of our devotions our connections so uh, so thank you very much so as now as I'm traveling a little bit uh, um, I think uh, for the next pith instruction, uh, probably very likely uh, it will be on th Thursday, not on Wednesday. So, but please uh, uh, watch on um, the Facebook. We will make sure give specific time uh, and date so that everybody knows exactly when we will do the pith instruction. Thank you so much. Thank you.